Hey guys, before this video starts, I would just like to let you know that there will be a part two and maybe even a part three to this video. There's just not enough time in this video to cover all of the sophomore wide receivers. There's so many of them. So watch out for a part two and maybe even a part three because we definitely do not cover everything that we need to in this video. Other than that, let's get right into the video. Yo, what is up fantasy addicts? I'm your host, That Fantasy Addict. And today, as you can tell from the title, we are going to be looking at sophomore wide receivers heading into 2020 from a fantasy football perspective. Now, I know there's some redraft people and some dynasty people, so I'm going to make sure to cover everything within both redraft and dynasty fantasy football, because there definitely are some players who are more valuable and who I have a different opinion on in one of the two settings. So with that being said, Let's get into the first player. Our first player up is Deontay Johnson of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And as you can tell, we are on this wonderful website called playerprofiler.com. A lot of the information that I have is from this website, and this is the entire visual of this video. So I will leave a link in the description to playerprofiler.com. They're a great website. They have a lot of very cool stats, and you guys should definitely check them out. So Deontay Johnson is on the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, who historically have been a very good offense. However, last year, Big Ben was out due to injury, but he's coming back this year. That's a very good thing for not only him, but everyone else on this offense. But we're just covering Deontay Johnson in this video as far as Pittsburgh Steelers players go. And Big Ben being back is going to help him tremendously. So that's one very good thing for him. And another good thing is his snap share and his route participation. And if you don't know, snap share is basically what percent of his team's offensive snaps he played on. It says right here 66.9%, and that percentage ranked him 80th in the NFL, with amongst wide receivers, that is. And route participation is a similar stat. It's just what percent of passing plays Deontay Johnson ran a route on. And he ran a route on 68% of those plays, which ranked him 70th amongst NFL wide receivers last year. So those numbers are very low. It's something that is really good because that number should most certainly go up next year, or I should say this year, considering that he was definitely their second best skill position on offense last year. There's no doubt about it. James Conner was not as efficient as he was two seasons ago. This team should like to pass the ball when they have Big Ben back, and Deontay Johnson should be an important piece in that offense. Now, when he played at least 70% or more of the team's offensive snaps last year, he averaged 12.6 PPR points per game. Now, keep in mind, 70% of the team's offensive snaps is not that great, but it's okay. And in those games, 12.6 PPR points per game is not bad at all. And as a rookie, that's pretty freaking good. So we can expect that number to go up and hopefully he can play 70% or more of the offensive snaps in most games. He should be, so it just comes down to whether or not they will do what they should and play him a lot. Now, he also averaged over seven targets per game in those games where he played 70% or more of the team's offensive snaps, and he never had less than six. He had a 16-game pace of 115 targets in those games. So if they use him like they did at times last year, he has a lot of potential for sure, and they should be using him a lot more than they did this last season. Also, the Pittsburgh Steelers wide receivers have the 10th easiest fantasy football strength of schedule per Pro Football Focus. I will leave a link to that website in the description below if you'd like to check them out. They do similar stuff to Player Profiler, and in this case, they look at every defensive team and they look at every offense schedule for this upcoming season, and they decide which schedule is the hardest, which schedule is the easiest, and everyone in between, and they ranked the Pittsburgh Steelers as the 10th easiest schedule for wide receivers. So that's a very good thing. He also had, as we can see here, 
the 16th best true catch rate in the NFL. We can also see that he had the 48th best catch rate, which is not good, but that's why we're using true catch rate because true catch rate takes away any of the awful passes that were uncatchable. It's just like catch rate where they divide the amount of catches divided by the targets, but instead of dividing it by the total amount of targets, they divide it by the total amount of catchable targets because that's really what matters, right? He had some awful quarterback play last year, Devlin Hodges and Mason Rudolph. This year he has Big Ben, who is an above average quarterback for sure. He should be getting some pretty good passes. So that true catch rate of 16th in the NFL says a lot more about who he is and what he should look like next year than his catch rate of 64.1%. Also, he had an average of 2.39 yards of separation per target that ranked him first in the NFL amongst wide receivers last year. If you're on Twitter or anywhere on social media looking at fantasy football stuff, you have most certainly heard about this. This is what is really leading the Deontay Johnson hype into this season. Him leading the league in target separation last year, it definitely is a very good thing that we can look forward to seeing next season. So he is a very, very good route runner. We can see that through his phenomenal target separation, and it is definitely something that can lead to success this season. Also, if you're not on Twitter, or if you are on Twitter but you just don't follow me, I do highly suggest that you go check me out and hopefully give me a follow because I put a lot more content out there than on YouTube. I tweet many times a day on there. So if you like this content, you'll love that content on there. I'll leave a link in the description below. Also, another really good thing about Deontay Johnson that I like is that he only had one target inside the 10 yard line and seven red zone targets. This converted to just one touchdown inside the red zone. Now, some people might think that this is a really bad thing because it means that they weren't targeting him when it really mattered inside the red zone. But the reason why I like that is because he is such a good route runner, right? We can see that in his leading the NFL in target separation. And people think that you have to be big to be a good red zone target, but that's just not true. Because when you're in the red zone, and especially inside the 10 yard line or the 10 zone, route running is incredibly important because you're so squished, right? The end zone's 10 yards, and if you're 10 yards out, that means that you only have 20 yards. So if you can get one step on your opponent, and make him not know where you're gonna go, and you're just a little bit ahead of him, or 2.39 yards in Deontay Johnson's case, that can be the difference between a touchdown and an incompletion, or maybe even an interception. Good route runners like Odell Beckham, like Antonio Brown, have always been touchdown producers, and it's because route running is important. So they should be using Deontay Johnson in the red zone and the 10 zone, and he should be putting up numbers. He only had one touchdown inside the red zone last season, but this season that number should definitely increase. There's some positive touchdown regression that should occur. Also, he had the fourth broken tackle rate in the entire NFL amongst wide receivers last season. This is per pro football reference. I will leave a link in the description below to that website as well. So he's very shifty. He has phenomenal route running and can break tackles, which means that he can take any target to the house any day of the week, even though he is not the fastest guy on the field. Now, it might sound like I love Deontay Johnson, but there definitely are some worries that I have about him going into this season. Now, his production premium ranked 40th in the NFL, and his dominator rating ranked him 42nd in the NFL. In case you don't know what these are, they basically say that he was not very efficient with his opportunities in comparison to other wide receivers in the NFL, even when you're accounting for the poor situations that he was put in. This basically compares the outcome of his routes and his targets given poor situations to other receivers in similar situations. And he was 40th and 42nd in those categories. So he was not that efficient last year in comparison to other wide receivers. He was also 55th in fantasy points per target. This is not a huge concern because certain players like Tyree Kill are naturally going to have more fantasy points per target since they can take any target to the house and maybe off of one target, 
they can fairly often turn it into 10 points. Guys like Deontay Johnson aren't going to do that as much. They're reliant on having a lot of targets, right? Which is why I think that they know that he's not going to be getting 30 yard yards after catch on a lot of targets, but that he definitely will catch the ball a lot and he will be open a lot, which is why they're going to be using him a lot more than they were last year. So the fantasy points per target, it definitely is not great, but he's just one of those guys who doesn't get a lot of points per target, but he gets a lot of targets because he is a good player and he is a possession receiver. Now, one last thing is he is undersized, right? He, according to Player Profiler, is 5'10", 183. Now, size isn't everything, though, because Antonio Brown, who also played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, as we know, he was 5'10", 186. So size isn't everything, but it definitely makes it harder to succeed in the NFL when you are a wide receiver. So with all this being said, do I think he's worth drafting? Well, per fantasydata.com, which I will leave a link in the description below too, according to fantasydata.com, he is going as the wide receiver 37 or an early eighth round pick in PPR drafts. Now, there are guys who I am targeting in pretty much every draft. Deontay Johnson sort of was one of those guys about a month or two ago, but his ADP has been increasing. And at his current ADP, I'm a fan of drafting him in one league if I'm in three, four leagues, but I'm not a fan of taking him in pretty much every league, which some people are saying that you should do with him. I just don't think that's the case because an early eighth round pick is someone who you should be pretty confident in. And while yes, I do think that he has a lot of potential and really he has actually the potential to be a wide receiver one, I think. He also has a lot of potential to really not be that great and I don't want to take that chance in every single league. But I am a fan of taking him in one, maybe two drafts because I do think that he has a lot of potential and I am fairly high on him. Now, next up, we have Debo Samuel of the San Francisco 49ers. Debo Samuel is an athletic freak, right? He really does rely a lot on his athleticism, but there's nothing bad about that because he is extremely, extremely athletic. As we see here, he ran a 448 40-yard dash, which ranked him in the 71st percentile. His speed score, which basically adjusts his 40-yard dash score for his size, that ranked him in the 78th percentile. His burst score was in the 81st percentile, and his catch radius was in the 70th percentile. So he's extremely athletically gifted, and he showed that last year. Now, just like Deontay Johnson, he was not used that much. Debo Samuel was 67th in snap share and 56th in route participation. Now, I do think that number should go up. So that definitely is a good thing that he was that low last year because he was able to produce with pretty little participation in their offense. Imagine what he can do with more participation. He was also a yards after catch monster. He was second in the entire league amongst wide receivers in yards after catch per reception. And as we can see here, he was fifth in the league in total yards after catch. This is once again really due to his incredible athleticism. Now, he was also 15th in the NFL in yards of separation per target. Just like Deontay Johnson, he is a very good route runner. We can see here 15th in target separation, which is a pretty good number, especially as a rookie. So not only is he very athletic, but he's also a pretty good route runner, which is definitely a good sign in a wide receiver, especially one who was a rookie last year. Now, using this data, we should be able to confirm that he's a very, very good red zone threat, especially when you add in the fact that he had a 50% contested catch rate. So those 50-50 balls, he was catching 50% of them, right? So the defender was possibly catching maybe 10, 15%, and the rest was just an incomplete pass. 50% is good for contested catches. So he's good with contested catches. He's a good route runner, and he's incredibly athletic. He should be a very, very good red zone threat, right? Well, despite having 17 red zone targets, which ranked him 13th in the NFL, and also having nine targets inside the 10-yard line, 
or the 10 zone, only one of these became a touchdown. They clearly know that he can be a very, very good red zone threat. He just didn't produce that last year. Some people might think that this is concerning, but personally, I think that he really just got a little unlucky because even though 17 red zone targets is very good, just as a sample size or from a pure numerical standpoint, it's not that reliable, right? So I do think that these numbers were definitely skewed due to there only being 17 trials. Now, from a football perspective and taking everything into context, 17 targets inside the red zone is good. But just from a pure numerical standpoint, it can be pretty fluky. So I do think that there should be a lot of positive touchdown regression as long as the 49ers use him how they used him last year. Just use him more, though. But use him in the same way still. Now, he also had the fifth highest fantasy points per target, as we see down here. So he's one of those guys who, even if he doesn't get too many targets, it might not be the end of the world because he can take one to the house, right? Sort of like Tyreek Hill. Debo Samuel is very athletic, pretty fast, yards after catch monster. He can take any target to the house for sure. Now, he was also, the, he had the 18th highest production premium and the 20th highest target premium. These aren't great, but they're pretty good, and it basically shows that he was pretty efficient compared to his team and the rest of the league. So he was pretty good when being compared to teammates that he has to compete with and in comparison to other wide receivers. Now, once again, it might sound like I love this guy, but there still are some things that we have to be cautious about. He had the 45th best true catch rate which is definitely not very good. So yes, he had the eighth highest catch rate, but that was due to Jimmy Garoppolo being a pretty good quarterback. He was actually pretty underrated last year. So once we take out the very minimal amount of bad passes or the uncatchable passes with, with him and the amount of uncatchable passes from other wide receivers, his catch rate isn't that impressive because his true catch rate, which says a lot more about him, was 45th. Now he still has Jimmy Garoppolo, who still is a good quarterback, so his catch rate may stay up there. It just is something to be cautious about that if Jimmy Garoppolo isn't as good this year as he was last season, that catch rate should be going down. He also had the third highest drop rate in the NFL at 11.1%. Now, this historically is something that rookies struggle with for sure, but it still is something to note. That number definitely should go down next year, but we do have to be cautious about this because you never know. It still could be a problem next year. He also has, per Pro Football Focus once again, the 13th worst strength of schedule, or I should say 49ers receivers as a whole had the 13th worst strength of schedule. That's not awful, but it definitely is worse than the average schedule. He also had the 25th worst average depth of throw, showing that he really relies on taking a short slant and taking it for quite a few yards, right? We know that he's a yards after catch beast, so there's not many people who I would be trusting with such a low average depth of throw than Debo Samuel. But nonetheless, even though he is great at yards after catch, that low average depth of throw is still concerning because if he doesn't take one to the house or he doesn't take a few targets for 20, 30 yards after the catch each, he could end up with five catches for 35 yards many games. And that is not something that I want out of him. Also, he's on a run heavy team. Now, part of that was because the 49ers were so good last year, but it still does seem like no matter what, they are going to want to run the ball a lot. So, even if Debo Samuel's snap share and target participation or route participation increases, there might not be as many targets to go around as most other teams have. So that is something to be cautious about. Also, they drafted Brandon Ayuk, 25th overall in this most recent NFL draft, and he is pretty similar to Debo Samuel. He is great when it comes to yards after catch. Now, I don't think that'll take his spot because he's a rookie, but it still is something to be cautious about. You know, he is similar to Debo Samuel, so maybe there's a few times where 
Brandon will pretty much force Debo Samuel to be put on the bench for a few extra plays than we'd like him to be. Now, with all this being said, he is the wide receiver 26 or a late fifth round pick. Once again, per fantasy data. All of these ADPs are per fantasy data in this video. Now, I'm okay if you draft him in maybe one league, if he falls to maybe an early sixth round pick, but I'm just not a huge fan of targeting him that much at his wide receiver 26 ADP, especially when considering who is going around him. And we will get to someone who is pretty much going back to back with him uh, in a moment. But if you're in best ball, now if you don't know what best ball is, just ignore this. It's a little hard to explain. But if you know what best ball is and you're playing in a best ball league, I'm okay taking him because he does have that weekly five for 120 and two touchdown potential. But in a regular redraft fantasy football league, I'm not sure how I feel about him. And in Dynasty, I'm okay with him. Still not someone who I really want as a fifth round pick. As a sixth round pick, I'd be more happy about it. But I am a little more hopeful about him in Dynasty than in Redraft. And by the way, with Deontay Johnson, I would like to add, because I think I forgot to give my Dynasty perspective on him. Um, I do like him a lot in Dynasty. I, I really think he's a very good Dynasty pick. I'm a huge fan of picking him in Dynasty as long as he's not going too far ahead of his ADP. Okay, so now, like I said, there's people around Debo Samuel who I like a lot more than him. So one pick later at the wide receiver 27, also a late fifth round pick, we have the one and only Terry McLaurin. Now, McLaurin is also an athletic beast, right? He is fairly similar to Debo Samuel in that respect, but there are a lot of things that I like a lot more about McLaurin. So as we can see here, he ran a 4-3-5 40-yard dash. That's in the 98th percentile, 95th percentile speed score, 77th percentile burst score, and 76th percentile catch radius. Now with McLaurin, usage was not an issue. He ranked fourth in snap share and third in route participation. This is a pretty good thing because it shows that we know that he is going to be on the field whenever he can. The Redskins are never going to be subbing him out. He is pretty much the heart and soul of this offense right now, it seems like. Now, the Redskins were 28th in passing plays per game last year. So that's a pretty good thing when you put this into context, because their new offensive coordinator is Scott Turner. He was the former quarterback's coach for the Panthers, and he was the quarterback's coach for them last year. And as we know, they threw it a lot, right? They had Kyle Allen for the majority of the season under center, and they threw it 600 times. That's a lot. Dwayne Haskins might not be great, but I do think that he's better than Kyle Allen for sure. So this team should be throwing it a lot, at least 540 times, right? This team should be throwing it more than they were last year. They should be about average, if not well above average, in passing plays per game, which just gives McLaurin many more targets to work with. Now, another thing that I think is pretty good is that Darius Geis is going to be hopefully healthy, right? It's not like he's so good that they're just going to ignore Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin probably still is the best player on this offense. But Darius Geis is good enough to the point where if he's healthy, defenses can't just put all the pressure on Terry McLaurin and just only focus on him. Darius Geis is good too. If you just put four men in the box, I mean, they're just going to give it to Darius Geis and he's going to work, right? So they do have to pay attention to the run, which will relieve some of the pressure from Terry McLaurin. Now, Terry McLaurin also led the NFL in contested catch rate. At 68.4%, he was catching over two-thirds of the contested balls going his way. He also had a decent sample, 19 targets, not the most in the NFL, but it still is enough to confirm that we know that he is very good when it comes to contested catches. Now, he turned seven 10 zone targets into just one touchdown. This is a pretty good thing because considering that he's so good at contested catches, we know that he should be good in the red zone and especially the 10 zone. 
seven 10 zone targets for him should become three, maybe four touchdowns. Last year, it was only one. I think that was most certainly a fluke. So this upcoming season, he should actually probably have more 10 zone targets and he will convert that into at least three, possibly even four or five touchdowns just in the 10 zone. In the red zone, he'll have some more as well, of course. Also, if we look at when he was getting targeted inside the 20 and 10 yard line, even though that offense under Dwayne Haskins was not throwing it in the red zone and 10 zone more than they were under Case Keenum. In fact, Case Keenum was throwing it inside the 10 and 20 almost twice as much as Dwayne Haskins. Yet Terry McLaurin actually had more targets inside the 10 and 20 with Dwayne Haskins. Dwayne Haskins was throwing about one third of his red zone and 10 zone passes to Terry McLaurin because McLaurin and Haskins have that Ohio State connection, right? They had chemistry going in to last season and now they'll have even more chemistry. Not only is McLaurin definitely the best offensive player on this team, but him and the quarterback know each other very well. There's no reason why Dwayne Haskins will not be getting him the ball whenever he possibly can, especially when it matters most inside the 10 and 20 yard line. Also, McLaurin ranked 14th in the NFL in yards per reception and 12th in yards per target. This is pretty good, especially for a rookie. And not to mention that he had not the best catch rate, but it wasn't awful. So as a rookie, when you're that high in yards per target and reception and still maintaining a 62.4% catch rate, which is okay. It says a lot about really what kind of player he is. It shows that you can trust him and he is a pretty good deep threat for sure. So that is something that I'm very excited about and it shows how good he really is. Another really good thing about him is that last year he was 10th in the NFL in quarterback rating when targeted. So basically instead of looking at Dwayne Haskins and Case Keenum's quarterback rating overall, they just look at his quarterback rating when they targeted Terry McLaurin. And that quarterback rating was the 10th best in the NFL in comparison to every other wide receiver. Keep in mind that he was being targeted by Case Keenum and Dwayne Haskins, who are not good at all. So that 10th quarterback rating when targeted really says a lot about how good he is. Now, also, he had the second highest target premium and dominator rating. This really just shows how much more efficient he is than his teammates, right? Dwayne Haskins is going to target him because he is just that much better than the rest of his teammates at the wide receiver position. And finally, he did rank 11th in the NFL in production premium, and that just shows that he is pretty efficient in comparison to other NFL wide receivers last year, and he did all that as a rookie. Now, there still are a few things that we have to be cautious about, though. He was 50th in target separation and 43rd in yards after catch. So while he did rank first in contested catch rate, when it came to yards after catch and target separation, two other very important metrics, he was not that good. Now, target separation is a lot just due to route running, and he didn't look that great when it came to route running last year. Yards after catch, a lot of it is due to speed, and McLaurin is fast, so I expect that number, yards after catch, to increase next year for sure, but it still is something to note. He wasn't great when it came to yards after catch or target separation, so we do have to be cautious about that. He also had the 72nd highest true catch rate, it's definitely not that great, right? We do have to be cautious about that. Now, in his defense, he was a deep threat, right? He was going for pretty long routes. After all, he did have the 14th highest yards per reception and 12th highest yards per target. So that is a reason why, but it still doesn't excuse being 72nd when you're that good, or at least when people think you're that good because people definitely are hyping up McLaurin a very good amount. Now, he also had the 85th target accuracy, and the reason why this is a pretty bad thing for him is because that number shouldn't be that much better this season, right? I do think Haskins will make a leap forward. He looked better 
each game pretty much. But nonetheless, he's not going to be great. He's not going to turn into Aaron Rodgers overnight. That target accuracy number isn't going to improve that much. He's not going to be getting the best targets next year, or I should say this year. Now, he also has the eighth toughest strength of schedule. That is not that good, right? He's going to be facing some pretty tough defenses. So even though McLaurin is very talented, you do have to be cautious about he's going to be going against some not so great opponents. Now, I will say Pro Football Focus, who once again um, is providing this data for strength of schedule that I'm using, they did say that strength of schedule isn't the most important factor. They said that the first and last or the best and worst strength of schedule had less than a 10% difference. So it's not that big of a difference, but if you're on the fence between McLaurin and someone else who are very similar in terms of talent and situation, maybe his eighth strength of schedule, his eighth toughest strength of schedule will make you sway towards the other player. Now, overall, what do I think about McLaurin? I actually love him. Yes, there are concerns, but there is so much upside. This offense should improve. There should be so many more targets going around. And McLaurin is so talented and athletic. He really is one of a kind, and soon he's going to be very, very good. So in Dynasty, definitely take him. We already pretty much saw his worst situation, right? Awful Redskins offense on a team that only threw the 28th most. They were not throwing a lot. McLaurin was a rookie. That's the worst situation we saw him in. It's only going up from here. I'm definitely a huge, huge fan of McLaurin and Dynasty, and same thing in Redraft. He's way too talented to pass up. He's a guy who, at his ADP, I don't have a problem targeting in literally every draft, right? Once again, wide receiver 27, late fifth round pick, per fantasy data and PPR drafts. I absolutely love it. I'll probably end up making a video just on him, or at least on him and a few other guys, And because I was doing some calculations earlier today, and giving McLaurin a pretty reasonable projection of a 26% team target market share and giving the team a total of 550 passes and not accounting for what could be a lot of progression and much better efficiency, I actually calculated or my calculations turned out to a pretty good amount of points per game. It was 13.5 PPR points per game and I was excluding touchdowns. I didn't even factor touchdowns. I just factored in targets, receptions, and yards. And he's going as the wide receiver 27, but that 13.5 PPR points per game would have put him around the 33rd wide receiver last year. We are not even including touchdowns. And I feel like this was a pretty modest projection. 540 team passes on a pretty bad team with the offensive coordinator that likes to pass the ball also a 26% team target market share. Nothing crazy there. Once you add in the touchdowns, I do think he has a very good chance at hitting double-digit touchdowns. He had seven touchdowns last year with much worse red zone efficiency than we can expect next year. There's a very good chance he has double-digit touchdowns. And once you factor those in, he's pushing 300 PPR fantasy points per game. Now, do I think... There, it's going to be the over or the under on that. Obviously, I'm not saying that he'll score 290 points. I would take the under, right? But I don't think it's going to be any lower than 250 points. And I'm just saying that I think there's a good chance he pushes 300 PPR fantasy points per game. I'll do a video showing my exact calculations and how I came to that conclusion later. But yeah, I love McLaurin. No matter what your scoring settings are, redraft, dynasty, PPR, not PPR, no matter what. I absolutely love him. I'll take him in every league as a late fifth round to maybe even early sixth round pick because he is going in the sixth round every once in a while. Now, our next player is on the Kansas City Chiefs and he goes by the name McColl Hardman. Yes, it is McColl, not Mikul. He addressed this. So you can call him Mikul if you want to, but that is not his name. It is McColl. Now, McLaurin ran a 4-3-5. Well, 
McColl one-upped him. He ran a 4.33. Pretty good athletic profile, as you can see here, 99th percentile 40-yard dash, 75th percentile speed score, 75th percentile agility score. Now, he is a very tough player to make a decision on. So just to start, he was 138th in snap share and 102nd in route participation. So he was barely used at all, right? And he didn't qualify, but if he did, per pro football reference, he would have been first in yards after catch. And it's not even close. He had 11.2 yards after catch per reception. The next closest was AJ Brown with, a, with, with excuse me, 8.9. That's not even close. Now, do I expect that to stay the same? No, 11.2 is not sustainable. But I'm just saying he was so efficient last year and so good when it came to yards after catch. I mean, he has so much potential for a 99-yard receiving touchdown any day of the week, right? There's always a chance that happens whenever he is playing. Now, he was also first in yards per reception and yards per target, so he's a real deep threat, right? And with Patrick Mahomes gunslinging it, his targets are going to be very accurate, and McCall Hardman definitely has so much potential on every single target this upcoming season. Also, he was 34th in true catch rate, which for a deep threat is not bad at all, especially as a rookie. That's a number that is not bad, so it shows that he has hands, but it's not great to the point where it could even improve next year. So I do like that he's 34th because it shows that he's good and there's room for improvement for sure in that category. Now, he, was, he also ranked 54th in drop rate. So even though drops are a concern with rookies, wasn't with him. So we shouldn't be worried about that in a sophomore season. Now, going back to being ranked first in things, he was first in fantasy points per target, first in quarterback rating when targeted. So yes, even though Patrick Mahomes is good, him being first in quarterback rating when targeted, it means that his quarterback rating when targeted was better than Tyreek Hill. So you can't use the Patrick Mahomes argument there because Tyreek Hill also had Patrick Mahomes. So obviously, 146.6 quarterback rating, that's going to go down next year. But it still does show how efficient he was last year. Now, being first in fantasy points per target, once again, that just shows how efficient he was three targets can lead to 100 yards and two touchdowns, right? It it really is incredible how fast he is and the breakaway speed that he has. Now, he was also first in target premium. This is actually incredible, okay? So let me just break down exactly what target premium is. Basically, it's how much better off in terms of fantasy points that quarterback was so in this case Patrick Mahomes how many more, how how better how much better off he was in terms of fantasy points when targeting him as opposed to anyone else on the field so keep in mind that when he's first in target premium with plus 51.6% it means that the disparity between how good Patrick Mahomes' fantasy points was when targeting or fantasy points per target, I should say, when targeting McCole Hardman was so much, just so much better than when he was targeting Tyreek Hill or targeting Travis Kelsey. If you go back to Terry McLaurin, he had a good target premium. But even though, yes, I love Terry McLaurin and I think he's great, um, he's going against some not so great players, right? Like Steven Sims, is he that great? No. So when you look at Dwayne Haskins and Colt McCoy, because he played a, f a few snaps, and Case Keenum's fantasy points, yes, McLaurin's good, but his teammates are so bad that the difference between McLaurin and the other players is just massive. And the difference between McCole Hardman and Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill 
is even bigger than the difference between McLaurin and his teammates. So obviously, do I expect this to stay number one next year? No, I don't think that's going to happen with anyone on the Chiefs because they're literally competing with their teammates and their teammates are very good. But it still does show this is the best way to show how efficient he was last season. There's no other incredible way to show it. This is the best way to really prove that. Now, also, McCole Hardman averaged 11.4 PPR points per game in weeks two to six, which was when Tyreek Hill was out. He was out due to injury between weeks two to five, and week six he returned, but he played about 50% of snaps because they wanted to ease him in. So I'm including week six because McCole Hardman did pretty good because he played a lot of snaps still since Tyreek Hill wasn't out, but he wasn't playing that much. So in in weeks two to six, he averaged 11.4 PPR points per game. That's pretty good as a rookie, for sure, especially as someone who still wasn't playing that many snaps. Like, even though Tyreek Hill was out, McCole Hardman wasn't playing 95% of the snaps in those weeks. So that is very good, especially as a rookie, that he averaged 11.4 PPR points per game. However, after week eight, or excuse me, between weeks 8 to 17, once Tyreek Hill was fully implemented back into this offense, McCole Hardman only played 50% or more of snaps once. Just once. Now, some people see this as a good thing because it means that he has so much more to play this upcoming season than last season because he was so efficient and he's so talented that playing a lot more snaps is going to be really good for him. And yes, that's a good thing, but you could also see it in a bad way because transitioning into the issues with him, they clearly didn't use him, even when he was producing. Tyreek Hill being there just took away their need for McCall Hardman, it seemed like. Now, do I expect his usage rate to be higher? Absolutely. But I do think it's concerning that they didn't use him that much last year because it means that I don't think that they'll use him as much as they should because they already have Tyreek Hill so they might not need another incredibly fast player in McCole Hardman. Even though the rest of their team still is pretty fast, McCole Hardman and Tyreek Hill are definitely the fastest guys on the field on their team. Now, he was also 58th in average target distance. So, of course, the problem there is really just that if he doesn't take one or two catches for 40-plus yards you're pretty much stuck with maybe three catches for 20 yards out of them sometimes. You know, it's not a good thing because you're really relying on him breaking out for a 40-plus yard gain multiple times a game. Now, even if he plays more, remember that CEH is there now. Of course, they'll probably target Hardman more than CEH, but when talking about offense as a whole, including running, Hardman's going to be the fourth option at the best behind CEH, Kelsey, and Tyreek Hill. And we don't know. Maybe Sammy Watkins will be used more than Hardman, which I definitely think is a great possibility. So we really just don't know how he's going to be used. So is he worth the draft pick? Now, he's going as the wide receiver 46 as a mid to late 10th round pick. I am definitely a fan of taking him in one league. If you're in multiple leagues, make sure to get him in one league as long as he falls to his ADP of a mid to late 10th round pick. Because remember, if Tyree kills out, I mean, yes, he was out last year and he didn't, and McCole Hardman didn't do that great. But this year, he definitely has the potential to be a wide receiver one if Tyree Kill goes out. However, with that being said, I definitely think there's a greater possibility that he just completely busts and isn't used that much. So I would not advise taking him much ahead of his ADP because if you're in four or five leagues, just wait for that one league where he falls to his ADP. And if you're only in one or two leagues, I'm not sure I would advise taking him unless you're really confident with your team and you know that you have two or three solid receivers that you can count on and you're willing to take the risk with McCole Hardman. Now, in best ball, absolutely take McCole Hardman at his ADP. I do like it. Just make sure that you have not safe receivers because you don't want to just target safety, but make sure that you have receivers who you know are going to be good. In Dynasty, 
McCole Hardman I'm not a huge fan of just because yes he's very talented but his ADP in dynasty startups is going up a lot and his price I'm finding with trading is going up a lot too if you can find him for the right price absolutely go get him because he definitely has so much potential and after one or two weeks in a row where he just goes off you can trade him for so much but don't overpay for him just be cautious with that and once again in redraft only draft him in one league and make sure that you get him at the right price now last but not least we have the massive Preston Williams of the Miami Dolphins. Now, Preston Williams, one of his biggest strengths is just his size, right? Player Profiler lists him at 6'4", 211 pounds. And Pro Football Reference, once again, which I will link to in the description, uh, they list him at 6'5", 218 pounds. So he is massive. He uses his size to his advantage, right? If you watch his film, he knows he's big and he uses that against his defenders. Now, he was 35th in snap share and 38th in route participation. I think this is a pretty good thing because when he was on the field, they were using him a pretty good amount, right? We see his hog rate was 17th in the NFL because they liked to throw to him when he was on the field. They were clearly targeting him when he was actually on the field playing, but they just didn't always have him on the field. So Ryan Fitzpatrick enjoyed throwing to him, but he just wasn't put in the game as much as he should have. And I think that considering he was pretty good and was a rookie, he should be playing in more routes and in more, in just in more plays in general this upcoming season, as long as he stays healthy, which I will get to later on. Now, his average depth of throw was 10th in the NFL. This is pretty good, right? Because even if he doesn't take one to the house, like Tyreek Hill might, it doesn't matter because if his average target distance is 14.9 yards, as we see here, even if he goes without a touchdown, even if he doesn't have breakaway speed, which he certainly does not, 14.9 yards average target distance is pretty good. So he's racking up points just from the yards itself. Now, also, the Dolphins actually looked okay last year. They finished 5-4 and four in their last nine games, including wins in Indianapolis, in New England, and against the Eagles. I do like what Brian Flores is doing with this team, and I think they should be not great, not even good, probably not even decent, but they should be in the game for the majority of the time. So if they're just completely out of it, they might take their starters out, they might take Preston Williams out, because, which I'll get into later, he tore his ACL last year, so they don't want to re-injure him. But if they're in the game, they'll be trying, they'll be throwing it all over the place, they're really going to be looking at the clock and just trying to win the game and throwing it everywhere they can. So as long as they're in it, it's a very good sign. Now, I would like to add something that I said in yesterday's video, um, the mock draft video, which if you haven't seen it, I do suggest you go check that out after this video is over. It was a very good mock draft. But if you saw that video, I would like to correct two things that I said. I don't know why I said this. It is not true at all. So basically, I said that the Dolphins were looked good, and that is not true at all. They did not look good. What I was trying to say was that they actually looked sort of like a reasonable NFL team, and people think that they were a lot worse than they actually were. They looked okay, definitely not good, not even really decent. They looked below average. But they weren't so, so awful. And that's just what I want to correct myself on because I said that and that is certainly, certainly not the case. Now, I'd also like to add that I made a mistake when I said that the Dolphins have a lot of weapons. They don't have a lot of weapons. I was just trying to say that they have more weapons than people think. Mike Giusecki, Preston Williams, Devontae Adams, excuse me, Devontae Parker is not bad. It's an average receiving core. 
but people think they have no weapons and they actually have some decent weapons. So when I said that they have a lot of weapons, that was definitely an exaggeration. I don't know why I said that. I had a massive brain fart there, but they had okay weapons and they're better than what most people think. Okay, so once again, if you wanna see that video where I made that mistake, the link to that video will be in the description below. Now, also, he was 14th in contested catch rate. So he's big, he knows how to use his size. He can, he can eye a ball in the air and he's good when it comes to contested catches. So in the red zone, in the 10 zone, he should be utilized and he should be able to convert given that he is pretty good when it comes to contested catches. Now, with Devontae Parker there, no team can just focus on Preston Williams, even though he's very talented, right? Devontae Parker is going to be the wide receiver one, so they can't double team Preston Williams. In fact, Preston Williams won't even have the top cornerback guarding him most of the times. Also, just using the eye test, right? Just watching Preston Williams play, you see he has so much potential. However, there definitely are a lot of things that we need to note because they are very big concerns. So Preston Williams had a whopping 47 yards after catch last season. That made him the 124th leader in that category last year. Clearly, he cannot rely on yards after catch. He is using his body to catch the ball, but he is not a yards after catch player. He also has the third toughest strength of schedule. So once again, it's not a massive issue, but it is something to take note of for sure. He was also 100th in true catch rate, showing that he was not catching balls that he should have, right? We do need to be concerned about that for sure. He also had the 13th highest drop rate at 8.3%. Once again, this is something that rookies do struggle with a lot, and a lot of times they fix it going into the next season, but it still is something to know. He had some dropping issues last year. It could translate into a lot of drops this upcoming season as well. Now, he was also 95th in target separation, which just shows that he is not the best route runner at all. Yes, he's good when it comes to contested catches, but not when it comes to route running, or like we mentioned before, yards after catch. So he really is banking on using his body to, to really take advantage of his defenders, getting those contested catches, and just being a big body out there, right? Target separation, definitely not his thing. So he can't use that in the red zone. In the red zone, he has to use his contested catch skill. Now, he was also... 59th in fantasy points per route run and 83rd in fantasy points per target. So was part of this just because he was on a bad team that didn't throw many touchdowns? Yeah, but a lot of it also was because he is not good when it comes to yak or yards after catch. He's pretty much catching the ball and getting tackled. So there's not a lot of extra yards there. So his fantasy points per target is going down which means that he needs to have more targets, right? But the issue here is the Dolphins were fourth, I believe. Let me double check that. Yeah, fourth in team passing plays per game. They can't improve much with that. They'll probably actually go down this upcoming season. So there's not that many more targets that he can be getting, especially because Devontae Parker broke out and he broke out after Preston Williams tore his ACL so now that they saw that Devontae Parker is a real wide receiver one, they might be throwing it to Preston Williams even less when he's on the field with Devontae Parker. So he's not good when it comes to fantasy points per target, and he's not getting many targets. That's a huge concern. And Devontae Parker's in his prime and finally found the right situation. He broke out this last season, and he clearly is going to be targeted more than anyone else, including Preston Williams, on this offense. Now, I mentioned a few times Preston Williams tore his ACL last year. That's a concern, especially because he tore it in week nine. Now, we know from research and data that once you are two years removed from a torn ACL, you are almost back to pre-injury form, 
you're not you don't have that much of an elevated risk of getting re-injured not only re-injuring your acl but re-injuring any part in your leg especially in your knee and we know that when you're when you tear your acl in the middle of a season it is really hard to return the next season so we saw that with dalvin cook in his rookie season right he tore his acl and the next year he got injured a lot and he was not that good but last year, he was great, and it was because he was two years removed from that injury. I was hyping him up a lot, and I kept saying, he is two years removed from that ACL injury. He should be almost pre-injury form, and he clearly looked like it, right? We have data to support that, and that's the same thing with Preston Williams. They said that he'll be ready for week one. Even if that's true, he won't look like he was last year if he actually returns in week one, and he definitely has an elevated chance or an elevated risk of getting re-injured. And nonetheless, throughout the entire season, he will not look as talented as he was last season. And I would like to add, actually, before I end this video, that before I did extra research specifically for this video, I was pretty high on Preston Williams. I actually drafted him in the mock draft yesterday, which, once again, if you want to see the link to that video will be in the description below. But long story short, I just really found myself through this research becoming a lot lower on Preston Williams than I was yesterday, actually. And I'm recording this the day after I did that video, but this might go up two days after that video was uploaded. So when you're watching this, it might be this, this video might be two days after I uploaded that mock draft. Um, just know that. But yeah. I really found myself becoming a lot lower on Preston Williams through doing this extra analysis on him. So now I'm not so big on Preston Williams. In redraft, definitely a no-go, considering his ADP is the wide receiver 54 at an early 12th round pick. It's not much of, it's not a very high draft pick, but there's just other players at that ADP that I feel like have a lot more potential. In... Dynasty, I do think he's a fairly good pick, actually. He's very talented, and in two seasons or three seasons from now, he could be really, really good, especially if he's in a better situation. So in Dynasty, I'm okay taking him. I think he's actually a guy who I would like to target in trades and in Dynasty startups, but I would honestly still probably prefer to wait until he possibly gets re-injured this season or until he just doesn't really produce this season because his price should be lower but if you want to trade for him now feel free to trade for him now as long as you get him for the right price and in dynasty startups i am a pretty big fan of drafting him because i think he's extremely talented it's just the current situation for this year is not that great but yeah that will wrap up the video guys thank you so much for watching i really appreciate everyone who tuned in please I know it can get annoying when people keep begging for likes, and I kind of got annoyed when YouTubers begged for likes, but I'm now understanding why small YouTubers begged for likes, because it, it really does help a lot. So if you guys enjoyed, please drop a like, please subscribe, and if you like this content, then remember on my Twitter account, link in the description below, I do put a, out, I do put out a lot more content on there, so definitely go check me out there, give me a follow, and there will be a lot more content out there. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you later. Peace.